Welcome to Anchors of Truth, live from the 3ABN Worship Center, Cry Me By a River, with C.A. Murray. Well, we welcome you tonight as uh, you were just welcomed by our announcer, but we welcome you again. And we're happy that you can be with us, those of you that are here in the auditorium and those of you that are joining us by television tonight. We, uh, I'm really looking forward to this Anchor series. We always bring in people from the outside, but occasionally uh, one of our own will do one. John Lomacain's series is probably our, our most requested series that's been done so far. Uh, I did a series. Uh, actually, my series was filling in for someone who had to cancel at the last minute. And so uh, that's kind of the way that, that I end up doing series here. But this is a series that we have been looking forward to and planning on for some time. Pastor C.A. Murray, um, who is a man we all love here at 3ABN. He's God's man. He's a preacher. He has an infectious spirit about him. And uh, I have grown to not only appreciate his ministry, but to very much appreciate him as a friend. I um, look forward very much to this series. The title of the series is A River Runs Through, and tonight's subject is Cry Me by a River. And I'm looking forward to that subject. C.A. Murray, I believe, is a brand that was plucked from the burning. As a young boy, about seven years old, neighbor across the street was going to Sabbath school. And uh, one way or the other, maybe CA will share some time with us how that happened. He uh, secured an invitation to go with him. And he's been in Sabbath school ever since. He was the first member of his family uh, to become a part of the Remnant Church and later was able to be used by God to lead other members of the family uh, into the, to the remnant church. So his story is very interesting, and I, um, I thrill when I think about it, how God used some neighbors to witness to him and how he was open to the message and ready to listen. Before he comes tonight, we are going to enjoy some music. And one of those that is participating tonight is a grandson of uh, C.A. Murray, Marcus Gonzalez. And he is being joined by Farah Berry. And uh, this, I am looking forward to their doing this song by Ralph Carmichael, which is a favorite of many, and it's entitled a quiet place. After the music, Pastor Murray will come. He will proceed his message uh, with a prayer, and uh, then he will be presenting the message, Cry Me by a River.
they were at the house Sabbath afternoon practicing. And um, last evening, Irma was trying to encourage Marcus to practice more. And um, she said, if you, if you practice, you'll get better. And don't practice just enough to do the performance, but practice to get better. And uh, she said, if you keep on practicing, you can be a yo mama. And she meant yo yo ma, but she said yo mama. But um, Marcus is a good student, and uh, we were encouraging him to keep on practicing because he, he does play the cello well. And uh, he and Farah are... Uh, temperament-wise are a good match. And uh, when she's with him, Fair's a little more driven, and she's driven to play the piano, and they practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And I said, you know, you ought to put that practice to good use. So we asked them to come, and, and they did a fine job. Amen. And we thank them. This week's Anchors deals with, with water. And... Um, the idea hit me actually when we were in Israel a couple of years ago. Um, I didn't know that there was a theology of, of water uh, in the Hebrew economy. I knew about the ecclesiology, the, the churchiness of water. I knew that synagogues were always built near water and on water or near access to water. And I thought it was for basically hygienic reasons, and it, and it was. Um, but there is, there is so much more in the Hebrew, the Semitic mindset as respects water. And I didn't really get a handle on that until we started going to, to Israel and going to ruins of synagogues and seeing how they were always built on or near water. And there was always the mikvahs, the, the ritual baths that were always there. And the, the cleansing and the washing was an integral part of their faith. And so the idea of water and the things that happened at water or near water kind of intrigued me. I wanted to do uh, a series on the, the micro aspect of water, but I found out that I wasn't theologian enough to, to plumb that depth. So I went to the macro aspect of water, rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, those kind of things, and there was time uh, to, to do that. But just about any topic you pick in the Bible, if you study it long enough, you will come up with gold because there is so much. The more I study of the Bible, the more I realize I, I, the less I know about the Bible because there is so much to know about the Word of God. And um, I didn't think there was so much on water uh, as respects the gospel um, till I began this study in, in earnest just a few years ago. Uh, so we began writing just a few days ago, and I was amazed at some of the things that, that God was showing me. So uh, tonight's message is um, Cry Me by a River, um, and tomorrow is Abana and Farpar, um, followed by You Gotta Get Wet, and then A River Within, and finally, Then He Showed Me a, a River. And we are hoping and praying that the Spirit of God will be here for all of these messages and that we can give you some encouragement as together we take one more step along the road that leads to glory. I've got to thank Irma because for the past several nights she would go in the room and say, are you coming? And I'd say, no, i got to stay up a couple of hours. And uh, then she'd wake up and come out and say, are you coming now? No, I've got to have a couple more hours. So she's been very patient with me. Uh, we don't like to sleep without each other in the bed. So if, if someone is in the house, they ought to be in the bedroom. So it kind of disturbs her when I'm in the dining room at the table with a stack of books maybe a meter high, and, uh, and she's trying to sleep. Uh, so I, I need to, to thank her very much. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalms chapter 137. The 137th division of the Psalms. Then we'll pray and launch forth. Psalms 137. I want to thank Jim for um, uh, his kind words. We have become great friends, and I almost apologize for what I'm going to do to him on tomorrow evening, I think it is. I have a couple stories to tell you about Jim Gilly. And um, 
I'll return his kindness with ill will. But um, I love him greatly and appreciate his ministry. Shall we pray? Father God, we call upon you now to be the honored guest, but also to be the teacher because we need to hear a word from the Lord. The hour is late in the history of this world, and Christ is soon to come. We would be prepared for that day, and we ask you even now to fill us with your Spirit and to teach us those things that you would have us to know. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm reading from Psalms 137, and we will read uh, the entire chapter. Beginning of verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it, for there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I'm reading from the New King James. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, that means tear it down, to its very foundation, O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed, happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Many times in the Word of God, you will see the designation in your Bible before a given or particular psalm, the words, a song of David. You will note that that particular designation does not appear before this song. Why, you might ask? Well, the answer is simple. David did not write it. The incident that is recorded in this psalm, the incident that the writer is describing, took place some 200 plus years after the death of David. So David could not have written this song. The, psalm is a, the psalms are a collection of, of verses and tunes and worship chants that are gathered together, most but not all, written by David. The psalms are divided into five books, each ending with a short doxology, a short hymn of praise to God. Each doxology starts with the words, Praise the Lord. That's when you can tell that you're moving from one book in the Psalms to another. Praise the Lord, that doxology will be there to divide the books. So though the Psalms is a whole, it is actually a collection of five different books, each containing a, a doxology at its end to make that division. Now most Jewish scholars say and agree that dividing the Psalms into five books is no coincidence because it parallels the five books of Moses, the five books of the law, the Pentateuch, the Torah. But it is this, shall I say, anachronistic psalm, this psalm out of place, that may be the one that draws the most sympathy by the reader. So Psalms 137 is not a Davidic psalm. Psalms 74 is not a Davidic psalm. They were written by someone else, and we don't know precisely who wrote them. There is some scholarly debate as to who wrote the psalms, but we know that David could not have written them because this incident takes place long after David was 
dead and buried. And yet there is much to learn from this particular song, even in its, and I'll use the term, imprecatory or negative aspects. This, this psalm, as you read it, has a little different flavor than the other psalms. There's some negativity in this psalm. There's some backbiting in this psalm. There's a little revenge asking in this psalm. So it has what scholars call an imprecatory nature. You've heard about imprecatory prayers? Uh, that's the latest thing in some places. An imprecatory prayer is a prayer where you're praying against somebody. Lord, I hope she breaks her neck. That's an imprecatory prayer. Well, this psalm has some imprecatory aspects to it. There's some negative things here. Lord, I hope Babylon suffers for what they've done to us. I hope their babies get dashed against the stone uh, for what they've done to us. So there's some negativity in this psalm that is not really reminiscent of the overall theme and flavor of the rest of the Psalms. So whoever this writer was, he was an ultra-Orthodox, kind of mean-spirited guy who believed in payback, Pastor John. And he puts that into his Psalm. So the Jews are God's people. They are captured. They are enslaved. Their nation was destroyed, their walls torn down, their temple incinerated and left in ruins, all of this at the hands of the hated Babylonians, these Chaldeans that were viewed almost as the devil. And now to make matters worse, these demons in human form are asking that we sing a song. They want us to be happy after what they've done to our kingdom. Now, I read some years ago by um, Eldon Chalmers, a great Adventist uh, psychologist. He said that song singing is something a person does when they're happy and content. Dr. Chalmers told us in the seminary that if you pass by the kitchen and your wife is singing a song, you're going to eat good that night. Because song singing is something you do when you're happy or content, unless you're singing the blues. But these Babylonians are saying to their Jewish captives, their Jewish slaves, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Sing us something that you used to sing to your Lord. We want to hear some little ditty that used to keep you on cold winter nights. They certainly didn't feel like singing. And so their response was, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we sing to our God among you people? Why should we waste our breath and our time praising God in front of you? It's interesting, the question is almost rhetorical. Because the answer is, how can you not sing? Let's examine the why of this situation. Why they're in a strange land. Why they're in this state of affairs. Why are they thus? I refer you to Desire of Ages, page 28. Ellen White gives us some insight into the Jewish economy and history. She says, the Israelites fixed their hopes upon worldly greatness. From the time of their entrance into Canaan, they departed from the commandments of God and followed the ways of the heathen. It was in vain. And I looked at the word vain just to make sure that I knew what she was talking about. Vain means ineffectual, unsuccessful, and futile. Waste of time. It was in vain that God sent them warnings by his prophets. In vain they suffered the chastisement of heathen oppression. God tried everything that he knew. He tried blessings. He tried cursings. He tried pats on the back. He tried punishment. But nothing ever seemed to work for very long. Ellen White says, 
every time they took one step forward, they took two steps back. And for nearly a thousand years, God suffered with his people. Isaiah chapter 2, Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. You know, there's no book in the Bible. If you want to really get a flavor of how God labored with his people, read Isaiah and Jeremiah. If you really want to know the lengths that God will go through to save somebody, just walk through Isaiah and Jeremiah. You, you, you see, I, I was telling Jim the other day we were talking, I said, you see a God who was almost schizophrenic in his, in his desire to save his people. On, on one breath, he says, listen, Isaiah, tell them, find another God. Tell them, don't look to me, don't pray to me, don't talk to me, don't come to me. When you suffer and fall down and scrape your knee, I'm going to laugh at you. I'm going to turn my back on you. I'm going to walk away from you. Oh, by the way, tell them I love them. You, you see an almost schizophrenic God. You almost feel kind of sad for God because he's pouring out his, his soul, his, his, his all for a people that just will not listen and will not obey. And you see that in Isaiah, and you see that in Jeremiah. The ox knows its owner, the donkey knows its master, his master's crib, but Israel does not know my people do not consider. This is God talking. If you want to understand the depths that God will go to save Israel, technically Judah, if you want to see how far they had sunken down, just read some of the passages in Isaiah. It will literally bring tears to your eyes to see what God is doing to save his people and the lengths to which he will go to try to get them to turn from their pernicious wickedness. Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is God tried. And God is trying. For a thousand years he tried. Just like he's trying today for the last 2,000 years since the death of Christ. 7,000 years of trying. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, I, I wish sometimes God could just kick the door down. I really do. Because I see people who are bound for hell and they just won't change their way. And God is standing at the door rubbing his knuckles raw, knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. If it's, I'm glad I'm not God. I kicked the door down. 7,000 years of knocking. Page 28, again, the book, the Bible says, or rather Ellen White says, they were brought into subjection to Babylon and scattered through the lands of the heathen. In affliction, many renewed their faithfulness to his covenant. The heathen systems of sacrifice were a perversion of the system that God had appointed. And many a sincere observer of heathen rites learned from the Hebrews the meaning of the service divinely ordained and in faith grasped the promise of the Redeemer. You see, when God forced Israel into other lands, it wasn't just punishment. He was forcing them to do what he had called them to do. See, if you don't want to go on your own, I'm going to make you go. And you can see a long line of, of heathen kings and princes and just plain old common folk who, because they rubbed shoulders with, Egypt, with um, Hebrew slaves, found out about God, gave their hearts to God, but God had to do in war what he wanted to do in peace. You see, when you read the Bible, the blood and guts and gore, this didn't have to be. These 39 books of trial and test didn't have to be. This was not God's will for his people. Could have been written differently had they just learned to obey. Rahab, Ruth, the Syrophoenician, these are individuals. They are samples of individuals who, through contact with godly people, gave their lives to God. But why did it have to be in war when God wanted it 
to be in peace. God had to force them to do what he had called them to do, what they were indeed created to do. And ladies and gentlemen, may I say, may I submit to you that we at the end of time run the same risk. As nice as it is in this house and in churches, 17, 18,000 in number all across the world, that's not where the work of God is done. Work of God is done outside the church. We come together just long enough to get encouragement, and then we go out and we spread the love of Jesus. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Prophets and kings, many of the exiles suffered persecution. Not a few lost their lives because of their refusal to disregard the Sabbath and observe the heathen festivals. As idolaters were aroused to crush out the truth, the Lord brought his servants face to face with kings and rulers that they and their people might re receive the light. Time after time, the greatest monarchs were led to proclaim the supremacy of the God whom their Hebrew captives worship, Nebuchadnezzar, Xerxes, Ben-Hadad, Naaman, who we will talk about uh, uh, on tomorrow, I believe. They learned from their slaves, and the gospel went to these kingdoms because of the Hebrew slaves that were faithful to God. But it didn't have to be that way. It was never supposed to be that way. Had they lived for God and obeyed God and followed God, God would have made them the head and not the tail. And we are told, brothers and sisters, this is going to happen again before the end of time. Some of you sitting here or some of you watching or some of you listening may be called before a judge or a prelate or a king or a president or a prime minister who will say to you, why do you believe what you believe? And you better be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within you, because that's your chance to stand up for Jesus. It happened before, it'll happen again. So we need to study to show ourselves approved. Now get this. Had Israel been true to God, he could have accomplished his purpose through their honor and exaltation. If they had walked in the ways of obedience, he would have made them high above all nations which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor. That's why God called them. He could have glorified them. He could have exalted them. He could have had all people of the earth coming to them for a knowledge of God. But they failed in their mission, said Moses. All people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. But because of their unfaithfulness, God's purpose could only be wrought through continued adversity and humiliation. Did you get that? Because of their attitude, God's purpose could only be wrought through adversity and humiliation. So God, as it were, had to stand over them with a whip to get them to do what he called them to do. You see, God's purpose is going to get accomplished. Amen? It's going to get done. Somebody's going to be warned. The truth is going to get out. God's people will be warned. Either you're in it or you're not. Either you're part of the building committee or the wrecking crew. Either you're on God's side or the devil. But God's ship is going to go through. The question is, will you? And for nearly a thousand years, God labored with his people. And the truth is, they never really got it right. God wants to use you, us, to lift up his name. The question is, will you, us, do it. Sadly, the only thing that will move you, 
us is humiliation. God's got to Jim cattle prod us sometimes. As I said before, God had literally to stand over God's people with a whip to get them to move. God called Israel, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, for one reason only. That's to spread the news and warn the world of the coming of the Lord. Now, what is the difference in how and what and why he called them and how and what and why he calls us? What's the difference? Amen. <clears throat> Forgive my pejorative English. Ain't none. There's no difference. We are called like they were called for the same mission that they were called. God called them to spread, to live, to share. God calls us to spread, to live, to share. No difference. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves is, how are we doing? Either we is or we ain't. Amen. Or ouch. Let me beg my point. Let me give you a little flavor and tenor of the relationship between God and Israel, his chosen people at this time. I'm in Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. Book of Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel stand before me, my mind will not be favorable towards this people. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? If Moses and Samuel came and begged for Israel, not going to change my mind, cast them out of my sight and let them go forth, and it shall be if they say to you, where shall we go? Jeremiah 15, 1. Tell them, thus saith the Lord, such as for death to death, such as for, such as for the sword to the sword, such as for famine to famine, such as for captivity to captivity. So he's, he, God explained to them what's going to happen. Some of you are going to be killed. Some of you are going to starve to death. Some of you are going to become slaves. Some of you are going to die of pestilence and disease. You see, they had forgotten God. The leaders had turned their backs on God. And now God was giving them the recompense of their... And, and, and I need to say this. You know, I was listening the other day to to um, someone on 3ABN, and they were saying, we have a Christian school here, and some of the students, by the way they act, say to us they don't want to be in this school. We've never kicked anybody out of the school. We don't send anybody home. Your conduct tells us if you want to be here. That makes sense? We don't, we don't throw people out. He said, we have a set of rules. If you obey those rules, you stay. But if you flaunt those rules and work against those rules, you are saying to us, you don't want to be here. So what we do is give you what you want. Amen. That's what God is saying. I've got a set of rules. I've got a way that is the best way. And your response to me determines how I can respond to you. It's like you have, you, have, you have two children, and you love all your children. But you know that if one child obeys and does everything mommy says and pretty much follows you, you can do more for that child than you can for the one that simply doesn't want any part of anything you have to say. Isn't that true? It doesn't mean you love one more than the other. It means you can help one more than the other because the one who cooperates gets the goodies. There's no way to get around it. If a child, if you say, go to bed at 9 so you can get up at 5 so you can do your work, and a child goes at 9, gets up at 5, and one says, I'm not going to bed till midnight. And then you try to get them up at 5, and they don't want to hear it, and they don't want to be bothered because, because they didn't get enough sleep. So you can, you can help that one child more than the other simply because they listen and obey. Well, it's the same way in, 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 in heaven. If God says, this is the way, walk you in it, 
and you walk in that way, there are a series of blessings that come from walking in that way. Amen. But if you say, I'm going to make my own way, I'm going this way, well, there's a series of steps that come from walking that way. If this way is paved and smooth and, and, and well-worn because God has smoothed it out for you, and this is stony and rocky and you got briars and bristles and everything over here, and you want to hack your way through the jungle, well, you're making your own way. And there are, there are things that come from going that way. And God may or may not help you there, but if he leaves you on your own, God cannot be blamed. Now, I'm going to come back to that in just a little bit, and you'll see what, what I'm talking about. So it boils down to this. Let's go to, let's go to um, Jeremiah 16, and I'll be, pick it up at verse 10. I got a brand new Bible when I was at ASI a couple weeks ago. Super huge print. I love it. But you know what happens with new Bibles? The pages stick together. And it shall be when you show this people all these words and they say to you, why has the Lord pronounced all this great disaster upon us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then you shall say to them, because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, they have walked after other gods and have served them and worshipped them and have forsaken me and not kept my law. And you have done worse than your fathers. And behold, each one follows his, the dictates of his own evil heart so that no one listens to me. You know, you almost feel bad for God. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're dating somebody, Jim, you dated Camille, and I know you broke up for a little while and got back together. John and Angie, I know your history because I was there for that. But if you date a girl and you're constantly loving and showing love and buying presents and, and, and giving all you can and she thumbs her nose at you, you got two choices. You can stay there and become a doormat or you can go someplace else. You know, you can try it for a while, and after a while, that gets kind of old. I love you, I love you. Here's some candy, here's some flowers, here's the keys in my car. <laughs> so you go someplace else where you're loved. Amen. Amen. That's just common sense to everybody but God. Ever thought of that? He has no place else to go. He can't do anything but love. He cannot change. Almost makes you feel a little sad for God, doesn't it? Whether you accept him or reject him, he's still there knocking at that door. And he knocked on the door of Israel's heart for almost a thousand years. Never got it right. And he says here, you've done worse than your fathers. And I've tried. And when you boil it down, two particular sins, Sabbath breaking and idolatry. Same sins of today. Not giving God his time and putting everybody and everything before God. Those things are written for time, written for our admonition. Same sins of today. Not giving God his time and then putting everything we can before God. The sins of the former are now the sins of the latter. You know, I wish I knew who wrote Psalms 137. Because as I said before, it seems almost a little out of bounds. They're crying over Jerusalem. But ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, Jerusalem wasn't their salvation. Neither was the temple. Jehovah God was. They're crying when we thought about Jerusalem. Well, what about God? We're crying when we think about the temple. Well, what about the God of the temple? The reason you're in Babylon is because when you were in Jerusalem, you forgot about God. 
Your salvation is not in Jerusalem. Your salvation is in Jehovah God. And those of us who call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists need to remember the same thing. You don't get saved because you're Seventh-day Adventist. You get saved because you're in Jesus. I said it before, I'll say it again. Every Christian ain't a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. And every Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. they're crying over Jerusalem but what about God? So number one, you sing because even in good times and in bad times God is worthy to be praised. That's why you sing. Amen? While probation still lingers, every calamity, every catastrophe is still mingled with the mercy of God. In short, even though it's bad, it could have been worse. That's a reason to sing. I've been to car accidents where the car has been mangled and flattened and people walked away. That's a reason to sing. My roommate in college, I'm going to talk about him again tomorrow night. My roommate in college had a, a lime green Volkswagen. Took Susan Trusty up on Mount Sano uh, and lost his mind and his brakes and flattened that car. And when I came back to the room, he's laying in bed, sore but still in one piece, crying over that Volkswagen. And a dean came in, Dean Butler came in and said, man, you okay? He said, yeah, but my car... He said, what are you crying about? You in one piece. You can buy another cheap Volkswagen. Every catastrophe, every calamity mingled with the mercy of God. So as bad as it is, it could have been worse. That's a reason to sing. That's a reason to sing. Two, you sing because God can find you as easily in Babylon as he can in Jerusalem. Amen. You may lose sight of him. He will not lose sight of you. So though you're in Babylon, there's something for you to do in Babylon. Amen. God can find you in Babylon just like he can in Jerusalem. So you ought to sing even in Babylon. Time is around. Let me go to Jeremiah 24 real fast. Jeremiah 24. I knew this was going to happen. Jeremiah 24. Um, maybe I'll just summarize it for you. No, i got to read it. Uh, the Lord showed me, and there were two baskets of figs set in the temple, set before the temple of the Lord. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captives, Jeconiah and his son Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, and uh, princes of Judah, with the craftsmen, the smiths, from Jerusalem. Now, I want to jump down to verse 5, uh, and I want to read it in three different versions real quick. The NIV, the clear word, and the New King James. This is what the Lord says. The Lord God says, like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes shall watch over them for their good and I will bring them back to this land. That's NIV. Clear word. Some of the people who were taken captive to Babylon are like these good figs. I will watch over them and treat them gently. I will bring them back to their land. Now, here's the new King James. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now, when you see Lord God like that, that's, that's the formal entrance into the king. That's Yahweh Elohim. That's as good as it gets. That's taken to the bank, guaranteed. I call, um, let me jump over that. Um, let's see. Like these good figs, so I will acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans, for I will set my eyes on them for good. You see, when, when you serve the Lord, can I say it? Even, even bad stuff turns out good. Amen? Everybody had to go 
to Babylon. But God said, I know those that are mine, and I'm going to take care of mine even in Babylon. I know the good from the bad, and the good I've set my eyes upon them, I will watch out for them even in Babylon. So my point is again, God can find you in Babylon just like he can in Jerusalem. And just because you're in a hard place doesn't mean that God has lost you or forgotten about you. God can take care of you in Jerusalem, and God can take care of you in Babylon. Amen? So you ought to sing because the same God who was there in Jerusalem is right by your side in Babylon. That's something to sing about. So even bad stuff turns out good when God is by your side. They ought to sing because even if everybody is singing rock or rap or reggae or rhythm and blues and you're the only one singing for Jesus, God hears it. And sometimes God puts you in the strange place just so you can sing. You ought to sing because you never know who's listening for your song. Tell you a true story. I went to a funeral uh, when I was pastoring the Ephesus Church, one of our wealthy, well-to-do snowbirds, that's a person who goes north in the summer and south in the winter, was on my and he passed. And he flew me down a bunch of, uh, along with a bunch of individuals on a plane to do his funeral. I preached a funeral. He flew this choir down, and, and uh, we had a wonderful, big, huge five-hour funeral down there in Miami. Well, they had rented this very swank restaurant for the repast after. So we all with our Bibles and our black suits piled into this really swank restaurant. And we were kind of over by ourselves. And I noticed there was this guy uh, kind of hanging around us. And he was kind of irritating us a little bit. Because first of all, everybody was suit and tie. It's a suit and tie restaurant. Mater D at the thing. You know, you got to check for your name on the thing. They call your name out and you walk to your seat. Um, and there's this guy in a shirt and he had a jacket on but kind of rumpled. Just kept hanging around us. And um, Someone said, why is that guy hanging around us like that? And he said, oh, no, just, he's not bothering anybody. He just kept hanging around. And we were talking about the Lord and all kinds of things, and he just kept listening in and hanging around us, but he was disheveled. He wasn't dirty, but he wasn't, this was a press restaurant. You know, folk, the maitre d' has a little white cloth over his arm, you know, and walks like this, a stripe on the pants and whatnot. And this is a very high-class, swanky restaurant. Here's this disheveled guy kind of hanging around us. Like, why is he hanging around us? So, um, it was time to, to uh, uh, the food came, and someone said, well, Pastor, why don't you pray for the food? And so I said, okay, let's bob our heads. And we all grabbed pinky fingers. If you know Irma and I, we do the pinky finger thing. I picked that pinky finger thing up years ago. Um, so we all grabbed our pinky fingers. And as I was about to pray, this guy in this disheveled suit said, all right, let's be quiet. The pastor's going to pray. <laughs> this, is, this is a... A high-class restaurant, Pastor. This is, this is, you know, 21. This is a big deal. And this disheveled guy is screaming. So I figured I got the floor because the place got quiet. You know, everybody got quiet. So I, I, I prayed, Lord, bless the food. Bless all of these people here. May they receive, you know, I, I milked it. May they receive strength from their food. May they eat in the knowledge that one day Jesus is going to ask for an account of their lives. And, and Christ is coming soon. I figured I got the floor. I, this is my time to preach a sermon. And, and I, you know, I preached a long time in the name of Jesus. Amen. And uh, the guy walked away. And I found out later that he was a co-owner of the restaurant. Dressed like a bum, but he's co-owner of the restaurant. And he knew that a, a, a party of Adventists was coming in there, and he was just hanging around, just trying to get some Something, and I found out from, from um, another Adventist in town that about two weeks before, his daughter died in a boating accident. And his son was driving the boat, and she hit something in the water. And so now his son is in the hospital. He's going through some mental stuff because he feels responsible for his daughter's, his sister's death. And this, this fella... Um, uh, was, was asking the Lord on that day, uh, Lord, I just, I just ain't got it. Can you do something for me? And then in comes this party of Adventists. And he makes the whole restaurant shut up so they can hear me pray. See, you, you, you sing the Lord's song 
Because you never know who's out there who needs to hear that song. You never know who's there, who needs to hear, who needs on that very day needs to hear something from you. Because maybe they're in a strange land. Maybe they're in a strange place. I, I got a good friend I baptized, an ambassador, I better not say the country, from the United Nations. Uh, and um, when I was Bible studying with him, he told me, you know, I, you know the Lord is so good. When I was an ambassador for the UN, I, I didn't care about the Lord. I didn't care about anything. But the Lord took my job. And I was in a strange land. I was in the unemployment line for six months. No job. Can't pay my bills. Wife looking at me funny. Two kids. You know, and it was during that time that I found Jesus. He said, I, I, I cherish the time that I was out of a job because that's when we found Jesus. He, he, he got a job with Metropolitan Life, became the Northeast Regional Director of Metropolitan Life, moved to Atlanta, um, and uh, became the Southeast Regional Director of Metropolitan Life. He was in a strange land, but he sang the song, and he found God. And now God is allowing him to rise on high places. So you sing, because sometimes God's God puts you there because there's somebody there who needs to hear your song, who needs to hear what you have to say, who needs to hear of the goodness of the Lord even in bad times. David said, I've been young, now I am old. Never, never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's something to sing about. So when you go to the cupboard and the cupboard is low, sing for Jesus. Because he's got something for you and someone needs to hear your song. Let me close quickly with the story. Sister Ina Lee Kitchen, I'm pastor of the Springfield Garden Seventh-day Adventist Church. When I passed her, she was 102 years old. She told me about the years when she joined the church. She said, and I've got to hurry up with this. She said, uh, one day, my husband lost his job because of Sabbath. We had no food in the house whatsoever. And he was pacing up and down. I went to the window, opened up the window, pulled my rocking chair to the window, and just sat in the chair and rocked and sang. She said, I knew God was going to do something. I just rocked and sang. She said, in about 40 minutes, this is Sister Ina Lee Kitchen, 101 years old. No need to lie when you're 101 years old. She said, there floated through my window, just as pretty as you please, a $1 bill. It landed right there in front of my rocking chair. She said, this was back in the 1930s. She's 101 years old. She said, a dollar could go along where you could get bread and milk and eggs have a couple pennies left over. She said, my husband went up on the roof to see who lost the dollar. While he's on the roof, I was making a beeline for the grocery store. <laughs> she said, I remember that to this day, that God will never forsake his own. See, that's why you can sing. Because even when you're not at your best, God is. He's faithful. He cannot deny himself. So you can sing in the sunshine, and you can sing in the rain, and you can sing in the good times, and you can sing in the bad. You can sing when you got friends, and you can sing when your friends are few. Because even if you have no friends, you got one friend, and that friend sticketh closer than a brother. And wherever you go, and whatever you do, that friend is with you. That's something, ladies and gentlemen, to sing about. Father God, we praise you and thank you for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to put a song on our lips and the love of Christ in our hearts and to sing the Lord's song wherever we are. For one day, we will join with angels.